Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the third of a three-part series of Ask the Experts forums. Tonight's forum is entitled, Ask Our Neighbors, the Chatham Experience. These forums have been co-sponsored by the Orleans Pond Coalition and Orleans CAN. I'm Fran McLennan, and I am president of the Orleans Pond Coalition. You will be hearing later from Doug Fromm, president of Orleans CAN. Our first forum was entitled, Ask the Scientists About Namskake at Marsh. The takeaways for that forum were, one, Namskake at Marsh has experienced no harm from septage treatment at the Tritown site for over the last 20 plus years. Number two, Namskagit Marsh would not experience harm even in the worst case scenario were all the treated effluent from a full build out treatment plant to go into the marsh. However, that is irrelevant because the plume from Tritown is not going into the marsh, but instead under a clay glare, under the marsh, and out into Cape Cod Bay. And number three, the Namskake at Marsh will be monitored and protected no matter what happens in the future at Tritown. Our second forum was entitled Ask the Engineers, Orleans Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan and Phase 1A. And the three takeaways from that forum are, one, Orleans CWMP is a flexible, six-phase plan for sewering approximately half, one half of the properties in town. Number two, it is based on peer-reviewed science and has been approved by regulators at both the state and county levels. And number three, phase 1A is a compromise plan for a conventional sewer system for the downtown area with treatment and disposal at the Tritown site. Because it is based on work that of our CWMP, it will require minimal additional regulatory review and it will qualify for 0% state revolving fund loans. So now let me do, introduce to you our moderator for this evening. It is Rich Delaney. And he is president of the Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies. Welcome, Rich. Thank you, Fran, and uh, welcome to all of you. And thank you for taking the time to inform yourself and educate yourself on, on this huge issue that is in front of our town. And as Fran said, the previous two uh, Ask the Experts forums were, were really helpful to lots of people with that good feedback. So thank you, Orleans Pond Coalition, for, for bringing us together. Uh, as the title suggests, ask the experts, we want to preserve, reserve as much time as possible for you to ask the questions. So we're not going to do extensive PowerPoint presentations, but our three speakers will offer some preliminary comments, and then uh, we'll certainly open up have plenty of time left to ask questions. But my, my introductory comments will be just to call your attention to some of the obvious similarities between our two towns. And it's really striking when you, when you start to go through the list. We're about the same size. Uh, both have, have some impaired waters. I you know that. That's why we're here. Uh, both have been planning and are planning to sewer approximately half of the town. Both have selected a centralized conventional gravity approach to it. Both have wastewater treatment plants adjacent to a salt marsh. They were the only two towns in Cape Cod with approved CWMPs, Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plans. So Chatham is a little bit ahead of us, a couple steps, maybe in a year or two ahead of us. And it's really to our benefit to have a chance to share lessons learned. One of the most, um, one of the best educational uh, activities for anyone is to have an experiential kind of experience that you can then relate to someone else. So, we can look to our colleagues and friends in Chatham. First of all, to Bob Duncanson, who will um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the process and the, uh, the approach that they use. He is the um, a director of health and environment for the town of Chatham. And then I'll ask Alex Halila, 
who is the finance director for the town of Chatham, to talk a little bit about the approach to funding and financing the, uh, the uh, project. And then Brian Dudley from our Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection will talk a little bit more about from a larger, from a regional perspective, but also focusing on Chatham and Orleans, sort of the uh, state regulatory and funding strategies as well. So they'll take maybe 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes each, and then we'll go right to questions from you. Okay? So, Bob, would you like to start, please? I'll get to start. Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for the invitation. Um, wastewater planning in Chatham started back in the 1960s. Um, back in 1966, there were the initial studies that looked at water quality issues in Chatham a little bit differently than we are today. Nutrients wasn't necessarily the, the big elephant in the room that it is today. Um, but there was a plan developed in Chatham in 1966 um, which recommended sewering various areas in two phases. Uh, phase one was completed in 1970-71, uh, built a wastewater treatment plant as well as sewered the immediate downtown area. So Chatham's had experience with sewers since 1970. Uh, for whatever reason, phase two was never followed up on, um, this being back in the days when you know, the federal government was paying on average 90% of the cost of wastewater treatment facilities. Um, there were a number of, of attempts during the 1980s to do updates to the wastewater facilities plan um, from the, the 60s. Uh, there were various recommendations made to uh, build new infrastructure and whatnot. Um, those went down in flames at town meeting. And the primary reason for that is back in those days, the way you did what at the time were called facilities plans, uh, was you threw money at a consultant and the consultant went off to their office in Boston or Hartford or wherever it was, um, did the work they needed to do and then came back six months or a year later, threw a big report on the, you know, the desk of the town and said, here, do this. Um, and that went to town meeting at the time and the community said, wait a minute, we don't have the faintest idea what, what's in here or what it's telling us or what the implications are. And, and so the town rejected those updates from, from the mid-1980s. Um, in 1989, Mass DEP came along with an administrative consent order to Chatham and said, you cannot have any more hookups to your existing sewer system. Um, and the reason they did that was not because of a wastewater issue per se. What was going on at the time when they originally built the wastewater treatment facility, the folks that cited it actually put it in a very good location. Um, they put it next to the, at then, uncapped landfill. Um, on one side, it was next to an industrial park on the other side, and then there was town open space and conservation land on the two remaining sides. So they really kind of stuck it out in an area where it had minimal impact, if you will, on the community. However, because it was next to the uncapped landfill, there was a concern on the part of DEP that whenever you discharge large volumes of water to the ground, whether it's from your septic system or a wastewater treatment plant or whatever, uh, you actually create a mound underneath that one particular area. And then that mound gradually flows out in all directions because water's trying to go from the high point to the low point. Uh, and there was a concern that as that mound moved, uh, it might pick up contaminants from the nearby uncapped landfill. Um, and then those contaminants could be carried into public water supply wells. So the DEP said to the town of Chatham, you've got to study this issue, you've got to come up with a better plan for that. Um, and so in 1997, there were a number of fits and starts through the 80s that never really got very far. Um, and then in 1997, we made the decision to do a new comprehensive wastewater management plan. Um, in the meantime, the landfill was closed and capped, which really took away one of the primary issues that led to the administrative consent order. But the ACO was still in place, um, and it required the town of Chatham to go ahead and do a comprehensive wastewater management plan. So we started that process in 1997. Um, and one of the first things we did before really even getting that project off the ground was the then water and sewer manager um, made what I think was his big mistake. Uh, when he asked the town planner at the time and myself, who was director of the water quality lab at that period, um, to participate in the process. And 
And so we sat down with him and we said, well, what happened to all those plans that were done in previous years and why weren't they successful in, in addressing these issues? Um, and so we talked about it and we said, okay, well, if that's the case, we have to do things differently. We can't repeat the same mistakes. We don't want to spend the town's money again and have it go to town meeting and be voted down again. Plus, you're under an administrative consent order. So we have to do this in a way that's going to be successful. Um, so we created a different process, quite honestly. Uh, in the previous attempts, as I said, it was all done by consultants. There was very little town involvement, either from the staff or the public. This time, we actually created a citizens advisory committee before we even hired the consultant. Uh, we went to the Board of Selectmen and we said, you've got to create a citizens committee that's going to be integral in this entire process from start to finish. They have to be the link between the larger community as a whole and the technical staff and the consultants. Because the information has to flow in both directions. The information has to come from the community up to the staff and to the consultant. And information has to go from the, from the consultant and the engineers and the scientists back to the community to make sure that everybody understands what's being done and why it's being done. So we created that Citizens Advisory Committee right from the get-go. Um, we were very particular um, in how we set it up. We set it up geographically because we wanted to make sure that there was representation from the entire community. Because believe it or not, even though Chatham is relatively small, we have a number of villages, and each one of those villages has their own parochial um, <laughs> positions, if you will. South Chatham is different from Chathamport, which is different from Chatham, which is different from the folks that have been on the sewer for years. They all had a different take on the issue. So rather than just opening it up to anybody and getting you know everybody from one part of town, we told the selectmen, you've got to pick people that represent all these various geographies and, and parochial interests. Uh, there was a big push to get a lot of special interest groups on the Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, we had a very strong Friends of Chatham Waterways, which is similar to some of your organizations that have a very focused um, position, if you will. Um, and we, quite honestly, we didn't want the process hijacked by any particular special interest groups, whether it was Friends of Waterways or the Chamber of Commerce or, or who it was, the conservation groups or whatever. So while they were members of the Citizens Advisory Committee, they were non-voting members. The, all the votes were targeted to the citizen volunteers because they're the ones that ultimately pay the bill. Uh, so we created that. They took part in the process of hiring the consultant and, and whatnot. So they were involved from day one and throughout the entire process, which ultimately lasted 13 years. Um, we started in 1997. Our plan was completed and approved in 2009. Um, I hate to say it, but we actually lost some members of the CAC during that time. And when I say that, it's not because they moved out of town. Um, it's because they actually passed away, um, because the process took so long. Uh, hopefully it wasn't because of the process, but uh, I think it was just the longevity. The chairman said right at the beginning, yeah, I'm here, you know, a year or two, I'll be done. Uh, after 13 years, he walked into my office and said, I'm done. That's it. Uh, so anyway, we went and went through the, the typical comprehensive wastewater management planning process, and I know what's been going on in Orleans is very similar. Uh, it, it took us longer, quite honestly, because things like the Massachusetts Estuaries Project didn't exist uh, when we started. Uh, the Estuaries Project really was an outgrowth of what was going on in Chatham in the, in the, uh, the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, prior to that, you know, nitrogen was just becoming the big issue at the time. Um, and prior to that, the impact of nitrogen on, on the various environments uh, was really a paper exercise that you, know, you did on a, a sheet of graph paper. Uh, there was little actual data and, and scientific analysis that went into it. Uh, and so we knew that that wasn't going to be sufficient. Uh, we actually contracted privately with modeling firms to create a water quality model for Chatham um, based on nitrogen, which and I'm sure Brian can you know, chime in. That was really the genesis in many respects of the Massachusetts Estuaries Project because DEP sat down with us and they said, well, how much did you guys spend on this? And we said, well, we spent, another, we spent about a half million dollars um, and we're looking at having to spend another 250,000 or so to, to refine it. And, you know, I, I fully give credit to DEP. They sat back and they said, you know, this just isn't the most efficient way to do it. We can't have 
all these various towns on Cape Cod and southeastern Massachusetts doing this individually. Um, as well as what do you do when you have an area like Pleasant Bay that's shared by four towns. If all four towns have different consultants and they all use a different model, how does DEP as a regulatory agency try to make sense of that? So the DEP rightly said, let's step back, take a better look at it, and that led to the creation of the Estuaries Project, which from a scientific and a, and a planning point of view was a great thing to do. It gave everybody the same level playing field. It gave everybody uniform science and uniform analysis across it. So when you're dealing with our neighbors, either Harwich on one side or the, the four communities around Pleasant Bay, everybody's on the same page. And that made a big difference. Um, but because the MEP was new, it took longer for us. We were the first ones to get our MEP reports, luckily, mainly because we'd already done half the work ourselves. Um, but that still made things go longer. You know, based on that, we then did what everybody does. We look at what the alternatives are. When you get your MEP report, if you've got a watershed where you have to remove 100% of the wastewater nitrogen in order to restore that water body, there aren't a whole lot of options. Um, you know, centralized sewers is really the only way to remove 100% wastewater nitrogen from a watershed. If you've got a watershed where you need to remove, you know, 60 or 70%, you've got more alternatives. You could do central sewers, you could do community systems, because they average about, you know, 75 or 80%. If you've got a watershed with lower nitrogen removals in the 30 or 40% range, you know, then innovative alternative septic systems may be an option. So you start looking at what the problem is, what the alternatives are, then you start looking at cost and feasibility. Um, and we did that, as I'm sure you did. You know, we had watersheds where there were multiple options, um, and you have to look at those on a cost-benefit basis. Um, sometimes it didn't turn out. We looked at innovative alternative septic systems in watersheds. We looked at neighborhood and community systems. And because of the size of Chatham, it's relatively small geographically, because of the the fact that we had existing wastewater infrastructure, we already had a wastewater treatment facility. Um, most of Chatham is already developed. We, don't, we aren't like Brewster and, and Harwich that have large tracts of undeveloped land left. For the most part, Chatham is close to what we call build out. You know, there's the occasional single lot here and there, but there aren't large tracts. So when you're looking to site neighborhood or community systems and you need two, three, four acres of land, in order to do that, that was very hard to find in Chatham. So, you know, those didn't turn out to necessarily be viable options. Uh, but we went through the whole process. And ultimately, our plan came up with the recommendation of, given all the characteristics in Chatham, given all the issues in Chatham, the recommended alternative was to ultimately sewer the entire community. Um, and to do it over a certain time period. And we did it, we ultimately ended up there for a number of reasons, some of which I alluded to. But there are other reasons to look at sewering and other wastewater technologies. Um, like us, uh, you probably have areas where you have extremely high groundwater um, conditions. We have an area known as Little Beach in Chatham, which is just south of the Chatham Lighthouse. If you've ever gone to the Chatham Lighthouse and driven now to Morris Island, say, to go to the uh, the Monomoy National Refuge, you pass through this little neighborhood there, and if you drive through, you'll see these big concrete bunkers in people's yards. And people ask me, what are those? Well, those are their septic systems. Because groundwater is only about 18 inches below the surface. And so in Title V, you need to have a minimum of four feet between the bottom of the septic system and high groundwater. Well, if groundwater is 18 inches down, you can't go down. You have to go up. So people have to build these concrete bunkers in their yard just for their septic system. Not only is it expensive, it's not the most nice thing to look at if you're driving through the neighborhood or you're looking to buy property there. There's other areas with extremely difficult soil conditions. You know, we tend to think of, of Cape Cod as a big sandbar, which for the most part it is. But there, there are pockets of very poor soil conditions. Um, there are areas in Chatham where I've done test borings for projects where we hit 40 feet of the absolutely most beautiful blue clay that makes potters drool. I've had people that are potters drive up when we're looking at it. Can I have some of that? You know, it's perfect for making pottery. So, you know, think about trying to site a septic system. Uh, it's almost impossible, and to do it, it becomes very expensive. We have areas of industrial parks, as you do. You know, we don't have oil refineries and petrochemical plants. We have car repair shops and boat repair shops 
They all use material that, frankly, we don't want in our drinking water supply. But they're all on septic systems. And so if there's a spill, either intentionally or unintentionally, that material passes through their septic system and gets into the groundwater. And we do have one industrial park that's within the zone two of our public water supply wells. Then in addition, you know, you've got five, six, seven thousand septic systems. Um, you folks probably know you shouldn't put certain things down your septic systems, and you probably don't. There are other people that are not as conscientious. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of talk right now about pharmaceuticals and personal care products. We can't keep those out of our waste, so if you're on a septic system, you're putting all that material in, back into the groundwater and potentially into the public water supply or into a private water supply if you're on a well. So all those things become part of the mix in terms of coming up with a wastewater solution. So we looked at all those, decided that sewering was the best option. We settled on a two-phase plan. The first phase, the first 20 years of the program, to sewer roughly two-thirds of the town to really primarily target the nitrogen issue. That being the big elephant in the room was to restore the estuaries, deal with the nitrogen issue, and, and do that initially. The second phase of the program, which is the remaining third of the town, does not need to be sewered for nitrogen reasons. Frankly, that could never be sewered if, if the town decides not to. But there were other reasons. There were the high groundwater, you know, the poor soils, the industrial parks, things like that, as well as the equity issue. That became a very big issue, the equity issue. Chatham didn't want to have, made a conscious decision that they didn't want to have two classes of property, sewered and non sewered um, you know, we can stand up here and argue whether or not sewers improve the value of your house. Um, based on everything that I've seen dealing with this for the last 25 or 30 years, studies show that sewering improves the value of a piece of property. So, um, and most people, I think it's similar demographics in Orleans as Chatham, but 60% of the properties in Chatham are second homeowners. They come from communities where sewers, they've had sewers forever. They come to China, they don't even know what a septic system is. I had so many people that come up to me and talk to me and say, well, I'm already sewered, why are you doing this? And I'm like, well, no, you're not. <laughs> and they're like, well, sure I am. You know, I had sewers back in Connecticut or whatever. Of course I'm on a sewer here. And I'm like, no, you're on a septic system. And they're like, what's a septic system? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of that. A lot of people are used to it. We have to learn to treat wastewater like any other utility. You know, we don't quibble over paying our electric bills. We just know that when we flip the switch, it works. We don't quibble over paying our gas bills or phone bills or cable TV or internet bills. Wastewater is no different. It's a public utility. And we have to learn that that's the way we have to treat it. Unfortunately, people have had this idea, oh, I'm in a septic system, I don't have to worry about it, it doesn't cost me anything. So why should I change and now pay for sewers? Well, you do pay for your septic system in many ways. But people don't recognize that as a, as a utility, and we need to change that mindset. Once we settled on sewering, the cost issue. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at the cost of all the various options, and that became part of how we made the decision of which way to go. We recognized right off the bat that sewering was not cheap, was not going to be cheap, was going to have fiscal consequences. By working with our then town manager and our then finance director, we broke it down. And, and presentations that I've done recently I have two slides. One slide where we have the costs that come out of the wastewater management plan, you know, $210 million, $40 million for this, $30 million for that. When you put numbers up like that, people's eyes glaze over. You know, you cannot comprehend what that means to you. So what we did was we spent a lot of time and effort taking those numbers and breaking it down to the point that we ended up making fiscal presentations to the Board of Selectmen in the community that said, hey, here's what it's going to cost you, Mr. Homeowner, on a yearly and a monthly basis. This is what it's going to cost you. Then people can wrap their head around it. When you're talking $30 million, they can't figure it out. When you're talking, if your house is valued at $600,000, you know, it's $25 a month, they understand that. Or, you know, if your house is a million dollars valued, it's going to be $50 a month, whatever the numbers work out to be. We spent a lot of time and effort doing that. We actually created a wastewater cost calculator on the town's website uh, where you can go in and you can enter your actual valuation that you get from the assessor's office. You plug that number in, 
and then it gives you what your yearly cost is going to be for every year over the next 50 years. So you can see exactly how much it's going to cost you as an individual homeowner. Um, we looked at various financing options, obviously the tax rate. You can put every, all the public infrastructure you want on the tax rate. We looked at betterments. And by, everybody know what betterments are? No. Okay. A betterment is when you take the cost of a project, a sewer project, a water main project, a road project, and you spread the bill only among those properties that are directly impacted. So if they're paving a road in front of your house, you and your neighbors that are directly impacted by that are going to pay for it. Or if the water main is coming down your street, you're going to pay for it. There's various ways to calculate it. You can calculate it on dwelling units. You can calculate it on the square footage of the lot, so larger lots pay more. You can calculate it based on the frontage of the lot. So again, larger lots pay more. That's a better. The difficulty with betterments is you can't take them off your income taxes. Um, you have two options. You can pay it all off at once. You can pay it off to the town over a 20-year period at a set interest rate, so you can spread the payments out. But they're not tax deductible. Your property taxes are, so that's an advantage of the property tax. Plus, when you do the property tax, you're spreading that cost out over the entire community. And Chatham's position was the entire community benefits from better water quality. It's not just the people that are going to get sewers next year or two years from now or ten years from now. Everybody in the community benefits. Everybody's responsible for it, and therefore, Chatham made the conscious decision to put all the public infrastructure on the tax rate as opposed to doing betterments or some combination thereof. If you go onto our website and you look under the comprehensive plan, you'll see some of the fiscal presentations we made where we looked at all the options. Zero percent betterment, everything on the tax rate, 25 percent betterment, 50, 75, all the various combinations of permutations so people could see what the impacts of those costs would be. Um, we look for outside funding sources, like everybody does. Uh, we all know the state and the feds do not have any money that they're giving us for free. Um, it's our money anyway, depending on how you look at it. Um, Chad was very fortunate. Um, because we had been working on this so long that when our plan was approved in 2009 and we looked to go ahead and move forward, that's just about the time the federal stimulus programs were being announced. Um, and so we were in a lucky position. You know, if you remember back in those days, the, the buzzword was shovel-ready projects. If you had shovel-ready projects, you were lucky. Our projects were shovel-ready, uh, at least for our initial phase. And so we initially started um, talking with the state folks about the state revolving fund, which I'll speak to and then Brian can, I'm sure, can speak in more detail. The state revolving fund is basically the, the available financing option, if you will. Um, and basically the way it works is the state loans money to towns. Back in the days of of the 70s and 80s, EPA used to give 90% grants. Nobody gives grants anymore. It's all low interest loans. So towns can borrow from the SRF program at 2%. Uh, and there's a process, and, and I know there may be some questions on that. Yeah, well, we, we, they, they, you're giving us lots of information, but at the risk of overloading the audience right away in our first presentation, um, I think we've, um, you've, covered, you've introduced the topic beautifully. and. Um, if I can, since we're talking about finance, perhaps go to the next two speakers. Uh, and you've done, given us, you've already clarified for me and enlightened me about the extent of sewer. I mentioned earlier about 50 50, but you actually have gone in general a lot further than we're talking about currently. So thank you very much. I don't, is that all right? That's fine. I, mean, you know, I do this all the time, so I get on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alex, you want to pick up the financing uh, discussion and go from there? Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, thank you. I think Bob hit on most of the major um, portions, but uh, as Bob said, we looked at um, different sorts of financing, the state revolving fund at the 2%. Um, Chad has been fortunate enough to be qualified for the 0% financing for a lot of our loans. Uh, we also were able to get USDA loans, and those were originally at 3.5%. We actually ended up financing at 2.75% for $23 million of our um, financing for our wastewater project. 
Uh, we received another $12 million from the State Revolving Fund. Again, at 0%, we had $1.4 million in ERA forgiveness. Um, so we were fortunate to do that. And then we did have some town financing general obligation bonds, uh, which were exempted. And those are at 2.8%. Um, Again, financing right now is really a great time to go out and bond for cities and towns uh, because the bond market is so low, 2.8% um, over 20 years. And the way we staggered our, um, the plan going forward is that we didn't want to hit everything all at once. So we've you know, gone out, we'll be going to go to town meeting next week for the next phase of 15 million so that won't hit the debt service for another couple of years, taking advantage of some of our debt that's being paid off and keeping that level, level tax rate. And that's basically about financing. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more. There's going to be a lot more. There's probably a lot more questions. Yeah. But I think, as you just started to illustrate, there's a strategy to construction. There's a strategy to the environment. There's also a financial strategy that needs to be thought through, and you guys have already, already obviously done that. Uh, Brian, would you like to pick up the conversation with me, please? Sure. Um, I just will spend a, a very short time going over a couple broader perspectives, and then. Um, I think reiterate a little bit of what I had mentioned last week about uh, the zero percent loan for those of you who weren't here, um, and for those of you who were, I apologize if I repeat myself. But you know, Bob had mentioned that uh, it was about thirteen or fourteen years for Chatham to fully complete its CWMP. Um, I think Barnstable has been at it probably for twenty years. Uh, Orleans has been at it probably for about 12 to 13 now, as, as it stands. And, you know, it seems like a long time, and it is, but I think what gets lost in all of that is that because it takes a long time, it means that there has been a lot of education from the citizens advisory groups, not only forms like this to educate the public, but also they have taken it upon themselves to self-educate themselves about wastewater. And it's probably the last thing they ever wanted to learn about. <laughs> but they've but they've done it. And that's you know and that's been a dedication that I've seen across the Cape and you know really across the state. But what that also means in that you know these people have given such dedicated service in them taught themselves about the nuances of all of this, that there's been a lot of thought that has gone into these plans. These aren't fly-by-night plans. They have looked at alternatives. They have evaluated different options. And with the help and guidance of their consultants, not with what their consultants tell them to do, but I really mean with the guidance of their consultants as the citizens' advisory groups drive the process, they have come up with a recommended alternative that they sincerely believe is the best alternative for the communities that they serve and that they represent. And I think that is a very important point to understand. And I also think that it means that you know the, the, town, the townspeople themselves really owe a great debt of gratitude to the dedication and service that these people have put forward with countless hours of volunteer time. And unfortunately, sometimes being in the public eye, they've had to suffer from a lot of withering and unwarranted criticism from people who don't, who aren't willing to step up and do the job that they have done. So I congratulate them for that work. Um, Bob also alluded to the Massachusetts Estuaries project and how that had created a little bit of a delay, but I think we would probably agree at least a warranted delay in, in the planning process because it did provide a scientific basis for coming up with good, defensible, and technically feasible alternatives. And one of the, you know, the overriding factors in, in trying to develop the MEP 
was in addition to having a consistent methodology by which we could determine what the nutrient loads were or what the nitrogen thresholds were and what the nutrient loads that each embayment system could handle is that it also enabled us through that analysis to provide a tool to the towns so that they could again look at the optimal solution and where is in the past a default alternative and recommended alternative that you would usually see would be to sue with the whole town. Now Chatham decided to do that for other reasons as Bob mentioned but most towns have not chosen to, to sue with the whole town and the reason that they can get away with that is because there is a, a greater fine tuning of a plan in terms of how much do you actually have to remove and where is it most effective to remove it. And in doing so, that minimizes the amount of infrastructure, whatever that infrastructure may be, that has to be provided. And it enables an awful lot of the communities to maintain on-site conventional septic systems where they can exist without having an adverse impact on the individual embayments. And again, I think that's a very important consideration um, to, keep, to keep in mind. Uh, and this is where I'll repeat myself uh, about the 0% loan from the State Revolving Fund. That was passed um, as a result of legislation filed by uh, former Senator O'Leary. And what it does is set aside a certain percent of the amount of money that is provided each year for capital projects um, and, and studies and planning studies to go to a zero percent fund, whereas most of the other loans, the remaining 65 percent, are two percent loans. However, in order to qualify for the zero percent, you have to meet five conditions. That you have to have an approved CWMP. That CWMP has to address nutrient-related impairment. There has to be a growth-neutral element to the plan. And I think it, it does, that does not mean a no-growth plan, but what it means is smart planning and staying within a defined cap over the design life of the plan, which is usually about 20 years. It has to be consistent with any regional plans that may be on the books, and that the town cannot be under an enforcement order for a TMDL-related violation. Now, in the case of Chatham, they were under an enforcement order, but it was not for a nutrient-related violation, and therefore, um, even still being under the terms of that ACO, they were eligible for the 0%. I'm very happy to say that earlier this year, we were able to lift any restrictions under that administrative consent order because Chatham had met all its requirements and obligations under that consent order, so now they are free and clear of any of the restrictions that were placed there. So, um, I think basically, that is, those are my remarks and my observations. And, um, Great. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank all three of you for uh, excellent uh, presentations. And thank you. Now, it's, uh, now it's our turn to continue what I like to call the a community dialogue, and a community dialogue that is informed by the best available information, whether it be regulatory or financial or planning and environmental. This is a tremendous opportunity to ask the experts directly, and so we can have that community dialogue all based on the same set of facts that are as accurate and up-to-date as we can find. So um, I would only set a couple ground rules. You know, we're all courteous people, and I'd like you to continue to behave like that. I'd like to ask you to limit your, your questions to just questions, not commentaries or statements, but 
A one minute question would be wonderful, and that would allow two or three minutes for our panels to each, or one or more of our panels to respond, and that way we can move through a whole series of questions. So that I'm sure there are many. And we have people in the audience who will bring the mic to your, to your seat, so I will begin by looking at the first hand. Right over here, please. The second row from the front. Did I just read? Did I just uh, read? Uh, could you just, oh, if you're waiting for the mic, you just, just give us your name, please. And, and Hi. I'm Renata Wasserman. I live on Thompson Road. Um, I think I misheard you. Did, you early, did Chatham have sewer system before this project started anywhere in town? Yes. You did? Oh. Ch Chatham had a wastewater treatment plant and the first phase of a sewer system that went online back in 1970. The 19th century, was it the downtown area? Or? Yes, primarily the downtown Main Street area, if you're familiar with Chatham. Right. Kind of that heavily developed area. And, it, and it's interesting because one of the issues that you always deal with when people talk about sewers is, you know, overdevelopment or, you know, with sewers there's going to be rampant growth. Downtown Chatham's had sewers for 40 years. Um, and for a vast majority of the Chatham community, the downtown area is exactly the area they want to continue to preserve because it's so Cape Cottage. And yet it's had sewers for 40 years. So, you know, there's no 30-story skyscrapers or anything downtown Chatham. It's exactly the way the community wants to retain it. And yet it's had sewers for 40 years. So I think, you know, that whole argument that sewers leads to rampant growth, Chatham doesn't prove that out at all. I mean, can you give me an average cost of what the taxpayer is paying for the Chatham system? I mean... Um, it varies based on... Uh, there's, there's really three things that go into the cost. One is the impact on the tax rate, which, which Alex can allude to. There's a connection fee, um, just like you're, if you're connecting up to the water system or gas or whatever. Uh, we've estimated that connection fee at anywhere from three to $10,000 per lot. It depends on your lot size and where your septic system is and whether you have a lot of expensive landscaping and all those things. Uh, and then like any other utility, once you're connected, you're going to pay a monthly fee, uh, basically a user fee, if you will, uh, that's based on your water usage. So just like you get a water bill for X gallons per month or quarter, whatever you get now, um, you will get a sewer bill um, based on the same usage. So, um, But Alex can talk more specifically about that. Thanks. You want to add to that, Alex? Um, you know, if, as Bob said, we have a wastewater calculator on our website. Um, so depending on the assessment, your house assessment, because we have put the, um, all the financing on the tax rate. Um, currently, we're looking at, I think it's about 27 cents on the tax rate for the entire amount of borrowing that we've done so far, which is um, $40.4 million. Everybody's paying for that. So everybody is paying for that. It's spread out among the entire town. No, not everybody's sewer. And, and again, as we said, because um, the sewer in the town benefits the entire town because it cleans up the estuaries. And individually they have to put the connection, they have to pay their own connection fee. That's the individual. Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. I'd like to put another a question right down here in the front row, please. I'll move around. I'll, I'll move from tip section to section. <laughs> centralized plant on the edge of a marsh for 40 years now. Have you ever had any kind of a problem with overflow, a hull incident, catastrophic, whatever? No. Um, the, the way wastewater treatment plants work is you have your wastewater treatment facility and then you have to have some place to put the treated water. Um, unlike Boston where they have an outfall that dumps it directly out into the ocean or other plants, say in Western Mass and other parts of the world, where you know you might dump directly into a lake or into a river. For the most part on Cape Cod, wastewater discharges here um, from wastewater treatment plants are very similar to your own backyard septic system. You have a septic tank, you then have a leach field or a leach pit, the water, the liquid goes into that and percolates back into the groundwater system. Same thing at our wastewater treatment plant. We have a number of what's known as rapid infiltration beds. Um, basically they're big sandboxes, if you will. Uh, we excavate down, we take off the topsoil, take out the trees, the roots, get down to the nice clean sand. The water goes into those, percolates down through the soil, which provides additional treatment, and then it, gets, it just goes right back into the regional groundwater table. So, yes, 
downgrading of our wastewater tre treatment facility, we had a salt marsh system. Um, that salt marsh system has been studied extensively all the years since we've had a wastewater treatment facility. Because keep in mind, unlike your home septic system, wastewater treatment facilities, if they're over 10,000 gallons a day, have to get a permit from that gentleman over there. And as part of that permit, they tell you what to monitor, how often to monitor, where you monitor, and what do you do with the results and whatnot. So we have had ongoing groundwater as well as in-stream monitoring um, downgrading from our plant since it was constructed, and that continues to this day. Um, and we have seen no adverse impacts on that salt marsh system, primarily because, well, for a variety of reasons, but primarily because salt marsh systems are really Mother Nature's way of dealing with this particular issue. Salt marshes are very good at taking up and utilizing nitrogen. That's why salt marshes are such healthy ecosystems. You put nitrogen in them, they love it. Now obviously you could get to a point theoretically where you can overload that marsh system, but I doubt there's a, a facility on the cave that would ever get to that point. Um, and especially with today's technology, um, and I know, you know Rich is probably sitting over here ruling the day I got invited, but <laughs> our wastewater treatment plant when it was first built was state-of-the-art 1970s technology. It was not designed for nitrogen removal. That wasn't even an issue back in those days. In the mid-1990s, uh, we took a look at the treatment plant. Nitrogen was becoming an issue. We said, is there anything we can do temporarily to increase the ability of that wastewater facility to remove nitrogen. All right, it was never originally designed for and the effluent, how many people know what the effluent of total nitrogen is coming out of your septic system? Come on, you guys have all been to some of the expert talks. You should know this. You had the scientists. Okay, what is it? Uh, ours is about uh, 55 to 60% because we have a denied system. Okay. If you have a D-night system and it's that high, you need to talk to me because that system's not working. Uh, no, but George tested it. He said an, an, average, an average Title V septic system puts out nit total nitrogen at around 30 to 35 milligrams per liter. Okay? Our previous wastewater treatment plant got that down to around 10 to 12 milligrams per liter. In 1996, we made some modifications to the original plant that we got it down to roughly six to eight milligrams per liter. The new plant that we just constructed, which is now state-of-the-art technology um, and went online just about a year ago, is averaging between two and a half and three milligrams per liter. That's currently state-of-the-art. So, we had roughly 40 years of putting treated water into the ground, upgrading into the Cockle Cove marsh system at somewhere between, say, an average of 10 milligrams per liter. We didn't see any impact. We're now putting wastewater in there that has 3 milligrams per liter. That salt marsh is probably going to look at us and say, hey, wait a minute, what'd you do with my food? <laughs> um, now, you know, you have to temper that with the fact that as we sewer more people, the volume goes up. So when you have larger volumes at a low concentration, you can actually increase the load. But as part of the estuaries project, as well as a separate study that was done, we determined how much load in terms of pounds per year can that salt marsh handle. And that's been written into our groundwater discharge permit with the state. And so as long as we stay below that, that marsh will be sitting there fat and dumb and happy saying, you guys aren't doing anything that impacts me negatively. Um, but that's uh, two to three grams per, per, per milliliter. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, yeah. That's really what we want to get. And, and, and I do, I wasn't ruling the day. I was glad you mentioned the ecological services that our natural systems can, can provide. I mean, people look at a salt marsh and say, okay, it's a salt marsh. But it actually, you could actually attach a dollar figure to the value of a salt marsh in terms of the natural services it provides. We can do it through a, a plant or through a, through a septic system or Likewise, the, the, the system does, the natural system does it as well. So that's, a, that's an important concept. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to follow up on that question? Or, we forgot what the question was, was so long ago. <laughs> Someone over here, in the back row, please. Yeah, Hank Schumacher. Say, uh, any project in, in the world that I've worked on, you have a monitoring system, and you 
try to determine whether what he tried to do in the beginning had any impact and what degree of impact it had. He said Chatham's had a sewer system since 1970, that's 40 some years. I assume there's been some type of monitoring system on what has been the impact on the Pleasant Bay and on the other estuaries on the Nantucket Sound. I think Brian can talk about this one. As Bob said, for any uh, groundwater discharge permit, we do have monitoring requirements um, both for end of pipe and then also for downgrading impacts. Uh, with the advent of the estuaries project and the need for targeting uh, certain nitrogen thresholds within the impacted estuaries, we have started to expand that monitoring to the estuaries themselves. We have what are called sentinel stations, and we're looking to uh, determine the trends based on improvements in meeting the target concentrations that are necessary for restoration of either eelgrass habitat or um, healthy animal populations within the sediments themselves. Um, right now, we're, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, the impacts on, on Chad because of uh, the way that they are staggering their, um, their phasing of the sewers. Our uh, monitoring is focused mo mainly on, uh, on Cockle Cove and not out at Pleasant Bay because they won't be getting to that until um, actually phase two um, in, in that area. Uh, but for example, uh, with the Falmouth permit, because that is impacting West Falmouth Harbor, we have uh, specific monitoring requirements within West Falmouth Harbor itself uh, to evaluate the eff effectiveness of the improved treatment that that new plant uh, has, as opposed to the old plant, which was actually discharging about 23 milligrams per liter total nitrogen. So we do have we do have monitoring plans in place, and we do have schemes in place to evaluate the effectiveness of these um, these remedial uh, alternatives and remedial um, options. Yeah, part of part of what we part of what we learned, you know, over the last forty or fifty years, um, is that groundwater, while it's a big system, there's local nuances. So we talk about watersheds for particular water bodies. So every water body has its own watershed, that land area that contributes water to it. So our wastewater collection system that we've had for the last 40 years was not in any of the watersheds to Pleasant Bay. So there, you wouldn't expect any improvement to Pleasant Bay from what we had already sewered. Uh, and in fact, the area that's sewered is really restricted primarily to just what's the oyster pond watershed which is a tidal salt pond that comes practically up to Main Street and Chatham. So what goes on there doesn't really impact any other water body. That's, that's, people need to understand it. You're working over here, so don't expect to see results over here until you do something over here. Because um, that's, you know, that's a critical piece that we've learned is that, you know, just because you sewer over here, there is not going to be improvement everywhere. Because all these water bodies are basically their own little discrete units. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad the uh, I'm glad the had your quick follow up then. I, I did. Oyster pond when I was a kid used to have lots of eelgrass in it. It has very little of any now. What and the sewer that was the watershed that the, the, that your sewer system was supposed to affect. So has has there been any evaluation done? Again, the question is, do we have any results, or is it going to take a hundred years? in Orleans to have any impact on Pleasant Bay or on Town Cove? Will it be 100 or 200 years before we see any impact? That's my question. <laughs> no, there'll be, there'll be a much quicker response. And, and you're perfectly right. The Oyster Pond watershed was one of the areas it was proposed for sewering back in the 60s. The problem is they never finished what they started out to do. So they only sewered a portion of it. And that, we now know, was not sufficient to address the entire problem. You know, it used to be years ago, people used to say, well, just sewer the people along the shoreline. They're the problem. Well, we know that's not the case. You can be a mile away from a water body, and if it goes in your septic system or off your lawn, sooner or later, that gets to the water body. Um, so you can't just say, oh, we're just going to sewer the shortfront properties. It's their problem, and the rest of us don't have to worry about it. 
So when Chatham did what they did back in the 70s, they never finished what they should have done, and so they never solved the problem. And that's why we're back here in 2013 trying to solve the problem. Because they, you know, you can't, it's like building a house. If you only put windows on one side of the house, it doesn't work. Um, you know, and so it's the same thing. You've got to do everything that needs to be done in order to see the improvement. Uh, you know, the Asteroids Project estimates improvements in five to ten years in most water bodies. Smaller ones with smaller watersheds should see improvement more quickly. Um, and that, you know, that's the whole adaptive management idea. Right now, what we're going forward for the next three years in Chatham is really to sewer or to deal with the entire oyster pond watershed so that we know that everything we need to do is done, then we can monitor it and make sure that it works the way it's supposed to. Good. I'm, I'm glad the monitoring question came up, and I'm glad you put it in the perspective of adaptive management, because we have had a, a, a fair amount of discussion about adaptive management in our town, Bob, and, and you just gave us a good illustration of how key the monitoring plan is to get the feedback, to make the adjustments, to make the changes so we can move forward. That's, I think that's, that's very helpful for us. All right, moving to the back row here, please, in the red. Sue Sasso. Uh, we talk about removing the nitrogen, and the piece of the puzzle for me, maybe should have been the scientist. What do we do with the nitrogen <laughs> that we reclaim? Um, that was, I've never wondered, I've always wondered, what happens to it? Okay, basically what happens is, we take nitrogen and we put it back in, nit put it back in the nitrogen gas, put it back in the atmosphere from whence it came. The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen gas. So the whole point of wastewater treatment and everything else is to take that nitrogen from the form it's in now, run it through a biological process so that those bacteria convert it back into nitrogen gas, and it off-gases right back into the environment. Where the that atmosphere has no detriment to the environment. And then it just goes back into this big global nitrogen cycle. Okay. And that's what we do. Good. Good. Over this side, yes. Jim. Uh, Jim Bass, thanks again for coming back, Brian, and uh, welcome to the chat, people. In Chatham, I know your form of government is a little bit different than you've got a town manager. Leading to the final vote for your CM, uh, CWMP, did your town leaders exercise positive leadership to get the town to vote positively to act? Thank you. <laughs> Jeez, I wonder if that's a loaded question for me. Um, I, I have to say, for the entire time that I worked on the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, which from, was from day one right through to today, um, I had the full support of both the town administration as well as the board of select. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, anyone in that section? Or you still coaches in? Yes, way over here in the front row. Wendy Palliser on the East Orleans. Um, I don't know if this is Chatham specific, but I've been to a few meetings now. But there's been reference made to the regional, a Cape Cod Commission and the regional plan. How does Chatham or Orleans fit into that? Because I'm interested in the Cape as a whole and um, very aware of being too insular in our communities. So I'm interested in the bigger picture and how that, how that works? Um, thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to let you go first. <laughs> the, uh, the tool wave plan that uh, the Cape Cod Commission is embarking on, um, as you said, is, is going to be looking at the opportunities for regional cooperation. Um, but I believe that the Commission has sent a letter to the town manager saying that uh, Orleans should be going ahead with this plan. And I don't see necessarily anything that would preclude future ability of Orleans to be able to integrate that into some sort of intermunicipal uh, solution. Uh, because right now, I believe the proposal for um, under Article 11 is to have a smaller plant than what was originally proposed, but it's modular in design so that it is easily expanded to accommodate 
whatever other areas in the future may be um, invited in. So is there a regional plan? Um, well, there, there is a regional wastewater management plan on the Commission's website. I think they released that in late December of 2012, um, which outlines the kinds of considerations that would go into um, the, um, I guess, the design considerations and the planning considerations that they would like to see as part of their development of regional impact review, which is the county's counterpart to the state's MEPA review, which is the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, and and then this other 208 study will be, among other things, uh, trying to hone in on other regional opportunities uh, for intermunicipal cooperation. And, and the, the, the thing about the, the region has the, 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 the ability to look at Cape Cod from the regional perspective. So they're viewing the 15 towns largely in terms of watersheds. So where they're, where, where they're, where they're sitting, they're looking down at ourselves and the other towns that share Pleasant Bay, for example, and saying rightfully, are you guys talking to each other? Should there be ways you should be communicating? And so they're not dictating a site-by-site -site kind of solution, but they're giving us principles based on watersheds. And they're going to help facilitate those discussions among the towns. They're going to help encourage intermunicipality agreements. They're going to try to look for funding that can be shared among the towns. So they, they're, they're, they're coming at it from a different level, but it's also to be compatible with what we're doing in our towns. And Brian's right. They've looked at our, town, our plan in, in Orleans, approved it once. They've taken another look at it and said you're still on track anticipating what will come out in this next version of the dual aid plan. So I think that's, that's a good question. I think you've got part of the answer there. Uh, in the middle, of the, in the, this woman at the end of this row here. Yes, uh, my name is Penny. And along those lines, I was wondering, is Chatham still working with Harwich about getting them sewered on as well? Yes. Uh, Chatham and Harwich are working on two specific projects right now. Uh, one that you've probably heard about is the uh, reinstallation of a bridge at Muddy Creek where Route 28 crosses. Uh, that's being done for various reasons, ecological restoration, salt marks restoration, water quality improvements. But both towns recognize that that has the potential to alter our infrastructure plans for wastewater. Uh, we both expect that if that project is as successful as we expect it to be, both towns will probably be able to scale back on wastewater infrastructure. That's part of that adaptive management that I mentioned earlier. You know, you do a plan and you say, okay, this is a plan. It's not like we're going to implement it all tomorrow at once. You implement it in phases and as technology and other things change, you change what you ultimately end up doing. Um, and then the other project that we're working on is as part of the Harwich Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, they've been talking to us about bringing wastewater from the East Harwich area um, to the Chatham Wastewater Treatment Facility as being a, a benefit to both towns. Harwich doesn't have to build a wastewater treatment facility, so they, they save money there. Um, it provides Chatham money because we're frankly going to charge Harwich to treat their wastewater on a per gallon basis. That's very common in communities that share facilities. Um, but we're also going to look at recouping some of the capital costs that Chatham spent to build the facility. You know, we're going to tell Harwich, yeah, we'll take your stuff, but here's what you're going to pay to do it. Based on the initial numbers that, that the two towns worked out at an engineering level, uh, it's still more cost effective for Harwich to do that. Um, and so, you know, this discussion about regional cooperation has really been going on for years. Uh, Chatham and Harwich have been talking for six or seven years. The Pleasant Bay Alliance, which is Orleans, Harwich, Brewster, and Chatham, have been talking about Pleasant Bay for almost 15 years now. So we're our little corner of the cave is well ahead on the, the cooperation topic. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, coming down, can I go right down front here to the second row in the front, please? Don Cameron, 
Uh, as you people from Chatham probably have heard, there's a fair amount of contention going on um, in the Orleans planning process, or at least the alternatives being considered. Um, could you give us some advice as to how you managed in Chatham to get the uh, the town meeting to actually vote for the plan that you put forth? <laughs> you, you mentioned you mentioned one thing already, which is being very detailed about the cost impact on, on the individuals. Were there any other strategic approaches to be used to actually make things happen, get the right vote? Tell them once, tell them twice, tell them a third time, tell them again, tell them again, tell them again. Um, it's, it's education, education, education. You know, we were at it for 13 years. Um, How many times did you vote? You know, there were hundreds of meetings, workshops, forums, newsletters that were mailed to everybody in town website that has every document ever created on there. Um, I brought a bunch of our frequently asked questions that I handed out here just to give you a sense of, of some of the stuff that we put out. Um, you know, most of the meetings were televised. Um, you know, so it was just, you know, education, education, answering questions. You know, part of why it took us 13 years was, you know, the public would ask a question. Did you look at this? Okay, then let's go out and look at it. Um, did you look at that? Okay. We went out and looked at it. Took more time, took more money. We probably spent somewhere between two and a half and three million dollars on the planning process alone. You know, we did a lot of specialized studies. We did specialized studies with the folks from MEP and Coastal Zone Management on the salt marsh system. We did specialized groundwater modeling, most in response to questions being asked. So that by the time it got to the $59.5 million vote at town meeting, um, people's questions and concerns had been addressed to the extent that you can do it. You know, is it 100%? No. But that's that's what you have to do. And sometimes that just means it doesn't go as fast as you think it's going to. Do you have any particular party in town that refused to believe the answers? <laughs> there, there are always people that once they realize they're actually going to have to open their wallets, you know, call the entire thing into question. We went through the entire process, went to town meeting, got the town meeting vote. It had already been passed by the state MEP office that Brian alluded to, had passed through the Cape Cod Commission Development of Regional Impact. Um, there was then an attempt by a group about a year after all that had taken place. Everybody, you know, all the public meetings, everything was done. Uh, there was a group that fired off five or six voluminous letters to MEPA saying this whole thing is a bunch of crap. And you should pull your certificate and make them start all over. Um, and so we had to step back and provide an equally voluminous response to say, no, oh, well, Chatham's been doing this for 13 years. You know, here's all the documentation that addresses all the concerns of these people. You know, I, I alluded to a scatter shot. Throw everything up against the wall and hope something sticks. Um, and you just have to deal with that when it happens, you know, and you just have to have good science, good engineering, good public policy, and that's how you get through things like that, you know. Did it cause me to turn gray? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. I think, you know, actually, we're, I think we're moving very similar to you in terms of a lot of public process and a lot of dialogue and, and dealing with these issues. So I'd like to go to this section up back now, please. Thank you, Alan, McLennan, Alex. Uh, welcome to Orleans. Uh, you and I have dealt with financial things in the time of challenge. But, uh, you, you've talked about the different debt uh, programs that you've been involved with, and you talked quickly about debt drop-off, uh, which allowed Chatham to do things. And then one thing that you mentioned was uh, you've got a staggered plan and you've got $15 million that hasn't gone out long term yet. And I know you're talking about bond anticipation notes, but could you just explain those to everybody? Because there's a fascinating market in that now, and, can take advantage of it, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, a bond anticipation note is before you issue a, a general obligation bond or get money from um, another source, um, the bond anticipation notes are short-term borrowing, usually for one year, um, possibly for two years. Um, they come in at a very low interest rate. Chatham was fortunate enough to get bond anticipation notes for, I think it was $14 million at 0.2432 percent, um, you know, less than a quarter of a percent. Um, so it's a very favorable market at this time for the short term. And then, as I stated, you know, we were fortunate enough to get uh, the zero percent from the state revolving fund, 
and even long-term obligation notes at 2.8% for 20 years, which is you know fantastic. This is the time um, to go out. If you're going out to look to borrow, this is the market is it's just so great right now. Yeah, one, one thing Dallas didn't say that you have to keep in mind is Chatham was well positioned financially overall. I mean, Chatham had a triple A bond rating, so that helps to get that you know less than quarter percent. But, but I think Willie's is double A plus, right, so, so you know you also have a very favorable bond rating um, to get a little percent. And sorry to interrupt, but um, I just you know I totally forgot. <laughs> All right, well, we have you captured for a little longer if you remember. Let's go over to this, uh, this section of you over here. Uh, Jim Trainer, uh, what is the total estimate cost of phase one, phase two, hookups to homes, repaving the streets, and uh, police details, or anything else associated with this? I can't tell you. I, I can tell you that the capital cost for phase one, based on $2,007, was estimated at $210 million. But because there's so many other uncertainties, 2% versus 0%, you know, 2.85 versus 3.25 on interest rates and, and all those things, it, it's next to impossible to put an, an absolute, it's going to be X top number on it. Um, you know, as I said, every connection cost is different. And, and you know, we didn't, you can't go through each property in town and say, okay, it's going to cost, you know, this guy $2,000 to connect and that guy $8,000 and whatnot. There's just no way to do that because you have to take into account when they're going to connect it and whether or not some silver bullet comes along in five or ten years and renders the whole thing moot. So, you know, you do engineering level estimates. Um, and so for us, the capital cost was $210 million. Does that include um, road pavement and all that stuff? Yes. Okay, yes. I'm going to move back over to the outside uh, section. Okay, they're still thinking over there. All right, good. We're going to go, uh, I see someone right here in the front of this section. Uh, second row, please. Judy Scanlon. This question is for Dr. Donaldson. Um, I'm curious how your wastewater treatment plan compares to our possible new treatment plan on the Amskagit Marsh regarding uh, gallons per day discharge of treated effluent. In our case, we know that we have a significant portion of our present wastewater plume going under a clay layer and not entering the marsh. Does Chatham have a similar clay layer? And if not, has 100% of the freshwater discharge to groundwater there had any negative ecological impact on the marsh, including any increase in the invasive plant fragmites? Okay, let's Two minutes to answer. <laughs> Three or four questions there. Um, Sorry. The, the current Chatham Wastewater Treatment Plant that went online last year has a capacity of 1.3 million gallons a day annual average. Um, it has a higher daily capacity for those days in you know, July 4th when everybody's in town, but we normally talk about an annual average rather than talking about the other numbers. So 1.3 MGD, as we call it. Um, it is capable of being upgraded to 1.9 MGD at, for phase two. So if we were to sewer the entire town of Chatham, it would be 1.9 million gallons a day. But for phase one, 1.3 million gallons a day. Um, there was some question about freshwater result. The clay layer issue. Um, yes, there are. There is a clay layer in Chatham, um, which does impact where the wastewater, the treated water, ultimately ends up going. Um, ours is not continuous. It's it's a fragmented clay layer. In some areas, it's complete. In other areas, there's holes in it, like Swiss cheese. Um, so we see wastewater impacts in both the upper aquifer as well as the aquifer below the clay layer. But more importantly than that, and, and this is part of the, the whole groundwater modeling that I talked about, and we work with DEP and the Cape Cod Commission as well as a, a private hydrogeologist whose name I will not say, but I know he's been involved in some of the Orleans discussions. Um, 
We developed a more detailed regional model right around the wastewater treatment plant, and so not everything from our treatment plant ends up directly down gradient. It spreads out over a large area, and so you have to take that into account, and you have to know how big that area is. So our wastewater, our treated water is actually going to multiple receptors, if you will, and based on all the work that was done in terms of how much goes into each one of those particular areas, you make the determination that really no one of those is going to necessarily be negatively impacted. So it's important to know that and not just assume that everything kind of goes in a straight, discrete packet to one area. Um, in terms of the Phragmites issue, Phragmites is already an issue in, in a lot of these areas because remember, a lot of these marsh systems are already getting fresh groundwater into them naturally, plus what you're putting in your septic system all ends up going in there. Um, based on the studies that we've done to date, even as, as we increase the wastewater treatment plant's discharge of fresh water, we're cutting back on the fresh water discharge from septic systems in the same watershed. So there's a balance there. It's not like you've got all this fresh water there going in and you're adding more on top of it. You're actually subtracting some out because no longer is it going through septic systems. It's just coming in from a different place. So. Um, so far, the studies don't, aren't telling us that there's going to be any significant freshwater-related impact downgrading. But that's what your monitoring program is about. And, you know, part of what we did, and, you know, I, I apologize, Rich, for you know, okay. longer answers, but, you know, part of what you do is you look at alternative treated water sites. So we didn't say, oh, we're just going to put it all here. We went through a study. We looked at about 20 locations around town golf courses, ball fields, other town properties to make a determination of, A, can they handle more treated water, or could they handle treated water? What might the downstream impacts be? What might the impacts to people's basements and all be? So if there was some indication through the monitoring program at some point in the future that, geez, maybe there's an upper limit of how much we can put there, we already know where there's other sites we can go to. And so that has to be all part of the planning process. So, all right, I'm over in this side of the room now, uh, right down here in the blue shirt, please. Thanks. Hi, Gordon Smith. I uh, learned a lot from your handout sheet, which was terrific. And based on that, you should be pretty well along on your treatment plan. And there's a lot of pipe on the ground, too. I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of that uh, construction activity. How are you doing on a budget to actual, now that you have hard numbers uh, for construction costs? Um, we, were, we were very fortunate, uh, you know, engineers do estimates on the treatment plant construction and on the sewer projects. Um, we were able to get our projects out on the street when the bidding climate was great. Um, you know, this was a couple of years ago when the economy was in a real downturn and, and contractors were hungry. Um, so on the collection system side, we put in about 12 miles of sewer, not because some of it kind of doubles up, but roughly 12 miles in total. Um, it built five pump stations and it came in at $12 million and the estimate was 20. So significant savings there. Um, treatment plant didn't come in that much lower than the engineers' estimates, but they had estimated pretty well um, and it came in just about right on. Um, and all, you know, we got multiple bids and the bids were all right on, so, you know, there wasn't that much of a range, so we know that. You know, things were pretty tight and the contractors really had sharpened their pencils. When do you so, turn the system on? Uh, the new treatment plan went online as of March 6th last year. Uh, it's been up and running for roughly a little over a year now. Was that an add-on to the existing one? Uh, no. Uh, as I said, the existing plan was 70s technology. Um, we basically reused everything from the old plant with two exceptions. Um, and we repurposed the old infrastructure, but the vast majority of the plant is brand new. Um, but to save on cost, we reused everything we could. And the only reason we got rid of the two things we did was they were right smack in the middle of where a new building needed to go. Uh, and just one last thing, if you're interested, um, we are actually having our water and sewer open house this Saturday. Uh, it's part of National Drinking Water Week. Every year we do it. Um, so this will be the first year that the new wastewater treatment plant is open for the public to come and tour um, Saturday from 10 to 2. So if anybody is interested in coming to see it, I 
open the invitation up to you. And if you're not in Chatham this weekend, but happen to be in Paris, you can tour the uh, the, the underwater yeah. sewer system, which is even more, more interesting. Yeah, that, I, I saw that. That looks really cool. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. It's really fun. Uh, I think I'm on this side of the room. Um, if not, I'll start back over. No. I'm not here. Here, look. I'm not She's had her hand up forever. Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh, I'm missing somebody. My glasses. Okay, there you are. Oh, it's Gussie. <laughs> Three times we thank you. Three times. She never recognizes me. So. Here's my question, and I've had a long conversation with Florence Sells and one of your selectmen. Um, anytime you do something, experience is a wonderful teacher. I said to her, Florence, what was the big surprise? What would you do differently? And she said, you know, understand more how you have to get flagmen around to keep the, the businesses open, and that's something you didn't know. So my question to both of you is, I know it's never perfect, but what would you do differently? And what can we as a town learn from that? In terms of construction? Um, Anything. <laughs> Implementation. Yeah. You know, during, during the planning process, I mean, you know, Gussie and I had lots of conversations over the years, and many, many times her response to me was, well, we're just not going to make the same mistakes Chatham did. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you guys no, aren't doing that. We're going first. Um, <laughs> You know, in, in terms of the planning process, I'm not sure there was really anything that I would change other than just coming to the realization that it is a long process and it's more expensive than people think. Um, and, you know, as much as you do in terms of trying to educate people and getting them to pay attention, the average citizen is not going to pay attention at all until you say, this is what it's going to cost you. They don't care about the science. They don't care about the technologies. All they care about is what is it going to cost them. And so they don't pay any attention to anything else. They only want to know the bottom line number. And that's what they make their decision on. Um, and that, you know, from a person like me who's a scientist and it deals with it, you know, that's kind of difficult to, to deal with because, you know, you say, well, look, you know, there's good science. You should understand this. And they don't want to. So, anyway. In terms of implementation, um, the big lesson that, that I learned, quite honestly, was having to deal more aggressively with the business community. Um, you know, we had a good plan to begin with. Um, it did not address the concerns of the business community, whether they were real or perceived. Um, we ended up, we budgeted for the, the collection system project along Route 28, $400,000 for police details. We spent $1.2 million yeah. on police details alone. Now, we're, we're, we're not, not going to argue over police details or flaggers. That's not to be decided at our level, an engineering level. That's a policy decision for the community. Um, you know, the business community has a big voice, and they had an immediate access to the Board of Selectmen and convinced the Board of Selectmen that we were going to destroy them, when in fact there was no period of time when you could not access businesses along Route 28. There was no period of time when residents couldn't get in and out of their driveways, with the possible exception of the 10, 15, or 30 minutes that it took to actually put the piece of pipe right in front of their driveway. But other than that, the town and the police and the contractor bent over backwards to minimize the impact on everybody in the area of construction. We spent a lot of time and money on additional signage. I, I was traveling in Florida, saw a great example, brought it back to Chatham. We spent a lot of time and money on it. Um, we did a lot of work with the business owners ahead of time, making special arrangements because you know, they only get their delivery on Thursday at 9 o'clock. The contractor, the police, made sure that truck got there Thursday at 9 o'clock. Um, you know, in, in spite of what some of the business folks will tell you, you know, where it, it was catastrophic, um, you know, they claim they lost, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, they claim they lost thousands of dollars. Did they lose money? 
no question they probably did. How much of it was related to the sewer construction versus the downturn in the economy? I don't know. You know, there's no way to, to show that. But, you know, when we do sewer construction again on, say, an area like Route 28, where there's a lot of businesses opposed to a totally residential neighborhood, we definitely will do things differently. Um, and that was the big lesson that we learned. The other thing, Bob, uh, we've got a unique problem here in town because we do not have a unified board of selectmen. We have two that are very much opposed to anything we do. When you were going through this process, did you have a unified board? Yes. And, and I was surprised because there was a, a number of years ago, an a, a individual was uh, voted into the Board of Selectmen that was a strong fiscal conservative, and that's what he ran on. And, you know, we have to cut, 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 cut. He walked in the door and said, I fully support the wastewater plan. It was the only thing that he kept consistently voting yes on. Um, but that gave us, because he recognized how important it was to the long-term value of the community, you know, that it wasn't just a one-shot thing, and, and therefore we could put it off. So, smart business decision. Yeah. I think I see a call for a timeout, and it's only to take maybe 30 seconds, and I think uh, we'll hear more about that at the end, but all three of our sessions are available, and if you've appreciated what we're doing tonight, and others in your community or your neighborhood or your friends want to see them replay, Doug uh, will tell us about how to do that uh, in, uh, in the wrap-up. Are we ready to go again? Okay, roll them. Starting up, can I come down here to the front, very front of the section, please? Mike's coming, sir. In the event that Orleans, for whatever reason, does not go forward with a sewering plan, will the state or federal government require us to do something? And if so, what and how will it be financed? That sure is right. Save the breath. The best for last, Brian. I never expected that question. <laughs> um, the reason why, really, all the communities on, on the Cape are doing this um, is to address water quality and habitat quality within our estuaries. Um, that being said, even though there is a recognition that it is the right thing to do, there is also a regulatory aspect to it. And under the Federal Clean Water Act, we are required to do what are called total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs, which essentially is a, a nutrient budget to determine what the assimilative capacity is of, of each of the estuaries. Um, exceeding that creates or results in impairment and the issues that we're seeing. So that, yes, ultimately, there does have to be some day of reckoning should communities not meet their obligations under the TM, under the TMDLs and the, the Federal Clean Water Act. Question is, when and how? Um, and I suppose my weasel answer is that we don't, as a, as a regulatory agency, we really don't discuss our enforcement strategies um, <laughs> in public. Um, but we do have we do have a variety of different enforcement strategies. None of them are pretty. When we start getting down to the levels that we would have, you know, that we would have to deal with, um, and you know, potentially, not that we want to, but potentially, some of them are draconian. So we have, we have really wanted to work cooperatively with the communities all along to avoid having to do anything like that. We're also, uh, you know, optimistic that as we all move forward, um, both, uh, you know, as, as individual towns, but I think more importantly, looking and recognizing that we all share watersheds the community share different watersheds, 
and they cross town boundaries, that as we get into more intermunicipal co cooperation, as we do look at regional solutions, that, you know, that would provide an impetus to encourage everyone to look to those opportunities because those will be the kinds of things that will reduce cost. Now, in terms of where does the money come from, right now there, you know, there really aren't any grant programs out there, as I think you've, you know, you've heard from Bob, and I think you've heard from a variety of different people over the years. Um, the best that we have right now is, you know, the zero, the potential for zero interest loans, which, you know, when you do get down to it when you look at the avoided cost of interest over the life of a project like this, it really can equate to about a 50% grant because you're not paying interest on that. So I think that's something to, you know, to keep in mind and, and that's very important. So um, I know that's not a complete answer and probably not as, as detailed an answer as you would like, but it's the best I can offer at this point. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Uh, someone who hasn't asked one yet, yes. Uh, and there's a mic coming down for you. Um, the next row up, please. Yeah. Dick Winslow. Um, back to the financial uh, effect on people. As far as the connection fees go, was there an option of financing that over time? There is, um, there is a county loan program uh, the Barnesville County Septic Loan Program, which does allow for connections to sewer as well as replacement of septic systems. I would have to say that right now it's not very attractive. Um, the interest rate is 5%. Mm -hmm. When that program was created 10 or 12 years ago, that was a great rate compared to what was available commercially, but it's no longer anymore. Uh, there has been some discussion about trying to get more state money into that fund to drop that interest rate down. Um, but, you know, right now you can go out to a private bank and get a loan for half that, you know, so unfortunately that's just not that attractive. There's also a septic um, tax write-off on the Massachusetts state income taxes as well that allows you to write off a portion of the cost over four years, I believe it is. Um, it's not a huge number, but again, it, it helps, um, you know, so. Did you have a lot of pushback from people on fixed income and you know, concern? Yeah, I mean, we hear that all the time. And our Board of Health two years ago passed a mandatory sewer connection regulation that says, thou shalt connect. Um, but not <laughs> uh, with any Board of Health order, you always have the option of appealing the order to the board and making a case that you, know, you can't afford it or whatever the situation may be. Um, and, you know, what the board's done in the past when dealing with the same kind of issue with septic upgrades um, is they will enter into basically administrative consent orders between the Board of Health and the individual that says, okay, you will do this when the house is sold or, you know, at some other point when there's, there's money changing hands. So those, those options are available um, for sewer connections as well. But it, it's definitely an issue. I mean, I have a lot of people that call me up and say, you know, when's sewer coming to my neighborhood, okay, I'm gonna start putting some money away today, knowing that it may, you know, I may need it in three or five years. Yeah. One thing I would say about the, uh, the county septic loan program is that even though it may be a little bit of a higher interest rate, it is, um, it is a loan program that extends over 20 years. So it's, it's amortized over a longer period than you would normally be able to get if you went to a, to a bank. Okay, one last question. I see no one out there still, so I'll go to this next. Uh, yes, this lady with your hand up. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, I don't know if it's too soon in the planning project yet, but is Orleans looking at the same consultants and engineers that Chatham used to? Uh, okay, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yes, no. Okay, well, this is, I'm. I'm Want to give the panelists just a minute to add any last summary comments that you might want to add to wrap up the things you said. You've been very informative. You've given us lots of information. Is there any one key take-home message that anyone like to leave so far? Maybe you guys have done a tremendous amount of work. I 
think it's impressive. Um, and uh, you know, as I said, as I said in my opening remarks, I think you'd be congratulated for that, for the dedication and uh, the resilience and the perseverance that you've displayed. Alex? Um, I would, you know, if, if you're interested in costs, as I said, and Bob mentioned the um, calculator that we have on the Town of Chatham's website, that gives you an idea of how we structured it, and there's a lot of information on the wastewater website in the Town of Chatham. Right. The, the more information you can get out there to the people, the better off you are, um, and especially the financing costs. It, it seems staggering, we say, you know, 200 something million, but when you structure it so it goes over a number of years, it doesn't all hit at once, um, it, it can be affordable. Thanks, Buck. Um, the only thing I would say, and this goes back to something that Brian said earlier, uh, is uh, it's not one size fits all. You know, people say, "Well, you know, we don't want to do what Chatham does." Well, that's fine. You know, your community needs to decide what your community wants and what you're willing to pay for. And as long as everybody knows what that means in terms of you know addressing the problem, then you know we don't all have to be doing the same thing. Okay, thanks. And, and I, I was keeping a little bit of a scorecard for a while, looking, listening to the general experience and seeing where we stand in Orleans. And, and I heard a few messages that I think are important to, to summarize with. The value of a citizen's advisory committee or process, which is invaluable there. We've been doing that in our town. To have to the value of having good science through a, math, a program like the Massachusetts Estuaries Program and the modeling that's come. We have that, the advantage of that. To be able to have a monitoring plan in place that helps us do adapt adaptive management, we're certainly embracing that. The, event, the value of taking advantage of creative funding and moving when there is zero loan um, options, we have been talking about that and thinking about the financing piece of it. The, value, the, the fact that sewers don't mean an explosion of growth, I think that's an important lesson learned for us in the business community and elsewhere. We learned um, the value, or at least clarified some of the numbers, the milligrams per liter of different types of technologies, from the septic system up to a decentralized, up to maxing it out with a centralized system. Those are valuable lessons for us to learn. We even learned where nitrogen goes at the end, <laughs> back up to the sky. So it's all been very informative, and I want to uh, thank you for your attention. I want to invite Doug Fromm to come up to the mic. He's the president of Orleans Can, the other co-sponsoring organization of tonight's forum. And I'll start to uh, summarize and tell us what's next. Okay, I want to thank the, uh, on behalf of Orleans Can and Orleans Pond Coalition, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, I just found tonight very, very informative and helpful personally as an Orleans resident. So I want to thank you personally, but also on behalf of And, and I want to thank you, Brian, for uh, uh, what you said about the, uh, the legacy of uh, years and the legacy of volunteers who have given time and energy to bring us to this point at our time. Uh, 500 hours of public hearings I learned at our last forum. Uh, and so it brings us to this time where we are in Orleans to, to make the decision. Uh, we hope these forms have been helpful. We designed them and we decided to execute them because I'm going to be very candid. We just thought there was way too much misinformation and disinformation going on around town. And so we said our goal is to present facts, to bring in the experts and let them speak to you directly, let you ask your questions, share your concerns, and we hope that has taken place. I think it has over the last three forums. There are takeaway sheets on the table in the back. I would encourage you, if you don't want to take them all, uh, it's a, a plethora of colors, be sure you take the yellow, the purple, and the salmon slash orange. Uh, those three, I think will be the most helpful for you as you prepare even for town meeting and take it with you to town meeting to be sure. And then this one that the gentleman over here referred to, the Town of Chatham Wastewater Project frequently asked questions. 
I have to confess that during one of the presentations, or maybe two or all of them, I was reading this. Uh, this, this is very informative and very similar questions that I've heard people asking, so that could be helpful. All right, little commercial. Tell your neighbors and friends. Tell them what you've learned in the forums. Tell them what you've learned tonight. Pass out those multicolored sheets to them so that they can read them. Answer their questions. Uh, and, and if anyone is saying, I'm confused at this point in time, I think what they're really saying is, I just don't want to tell you where I am on this issue. Because I think now with all the commentaries and the forums and everything that's been put out there, uh, the confusion has been greatly minimized. And that was a goal. All that remains now is what? To vote for Article 11. In Greek, uh, and I had to study Greek in college and graduate school, there is a word called kairos. Anybody here study Greek? Give me the definition you know. I'm just curious. It's a, um, a rare moment of opportunity. Perfect. <laughs> time in Greek is critical time. It is a rare moment of opportunity, or as we used to say in graduate school, it's the pregnant time. <laughs> and just like you don't stop a delivery, you help deliver it, and then you celebrate it. That's where we are in Orleans. This is Cairo's time to deliver Article 11, and then to celebrate what we have done for the future. Uh, keep the main thing the main thing, Monday in town meeting. Keep the main thing the main thing. What is that? 3.5 million for an engineering design of Phase 1A and a pre-engineering design for Meeting House Pond. 3.5 million. That's all we're voting on and talking about at this time. That, don't let it be confused into all these other, other statements and scary um, predictions of costs and so forth. You can question this on money and you can say what is the long-term cost and what is this going to cost me? That's a dollar and cents question. You can also say what is the long-term cost if we do not do this? That's an environmental question and that's a question about remediation of our waters and keeping them safe and clean for future generations. If you haven't read the commentary by Pat Fallander in the last issue of the Cotter, I encourage you to read it. She cites how in the 50s, the 1950s, this town was faced with a question, should we provide water to all the residents and businesses in our town. It was a huge, huge step for a town to take at that time. Some of you may have been here at that time and voted on it, I don't know. But they did. And you and I enjoy that today. That's a legacy they gave us. They stepped up to the challenge, they did it. The same is before us now in the time of opportunity, the Kairos time, to step up now on this issue to begin the CWMP Phase 1A and Meeting House Pond so that we leave a legacy to the generations that come after us. We can do this. We can do this. Personally, we need to do this and we should do this. Thank you. End of sermon. We can go home. <laughs>